So in this example, we're told we have gas contained within a piston cylinder assembly, and we're told some initial volume, that the piston is going through a constant pressure expansion. I'm gonna highlight that because that's gonna be important, I suspect. And it goes to some final volume that's given. We're also told that the gas is being slowly heated through the base right down here. And we're also given the change in internal energy of the gas. The piston and cylinder walls are fabricated from heat resistant materials. So that means this wall, the piston and that wall are heat resistant, meaning there's no heat transfer going through those. And that the piston moves smoothly in the cylinder. So there's no friction here at the walls. We're also told the local atmospheric pressure out here. So the first question is evaluate the work done by the gas and the heat added to the gas. So there are actually two parts there. Now to find the work done by the gas, that's gonna be PDV work. So we'll make our system the gas. And I know it's PDV work because the gas is expanding, moving the piston, that's being caused by pressure that the gas is exerting on the piston. So to find that work done by the gas, which is our system, it's gonna be the integral of PDV. So we go some, from some initial volume to some final volume. Now, since we're told that it's a constant pressure expansion, that pressure can come outside the integral. Now, if it's not a constant, then we can't do that. But here we're told it is a constant, so it comes outside the integral, and that makes it easy to evaluate that integral. It's just gonna be the pressure times the final volume minus the initial volume. And we're given all of this information. The pressure is two bars, it's an absolute pressure. Uh, the volume we're given as the initial, I'm sorry, the final volume is 0 0.12 cubic meters and the initial volume is 0 0.1 cubic meters. So when you plug in those numbers, you'll get that the work done by the gas is four kilojoules. All right, so that's the first part of part A. Now to find the heat added to the gas, my first thought there is, you know, I think about what things involve heat transfer, and the first law of thermodynamics involves heat transfer. It also involves work. So it makes sense to attempt to apply the first law to the same system of gas. So let's write that out. So the first law, we'll write out the equation. So the change in total energy of the system is equal to the energy added into the system via heat transfer minus the work done by the system on the surroundings. Now, we just calculated the work done by the system on the surroundings. That was the four kilojoules that we just calculated. We're trying to find the heat added. That's this part right here. So we're trying to calculate that. Now, the change in total energy of the system, remember that that's comprised of change in internal energy plus the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy of our system. Now, the change in kinetic energy is gonna be zero because the piston cylinder arrangement isn't moving around. It's not changing its speed or anything like that. So it's just slowly expanding. So that, that's gonna be zero. Change in potential energy of the gas, it does actually change a little bit. You know, if the piston moves upward, the center of mass of that gas does change, but it'll be a very small amount because the gas, first of all, has very small mass and the change in elevation is likely very small. So that change in potential energy, we're gonna assume is basically negligible. Now the change in internal energy, we're given right up here. The, we're told that the change in internal energy of the gas is 0.25 kilojoules, so we'll put that right there, that's a given. So then when you solve this for the heat added into the system, that comes out to be, what is that, 4.25 kilojoules. All right, so that's, Part A of the problem, let's move on to part B. What is the work done on the piston due to the surrounding pressure? So now we're interested in the piston here. So I'm going to erase my original identifier for the system and I'm gonna make my piston the system. And now if I think about that, I've got the, so I'm trying to calculate the work done on the piston here where that, that work is going to be coming from the force that the atmosphere exerts on the piston because we have some pressure here that's acting on the piston face. So that pressure force is going to be the pressure of the atmosphere times the area of the piston. So that's my pressure force. But I also have a pressure force that the gas exerts on the piston as well. So that'll be the pressure in the gas, P gas, my, times the area of the piston as well. So these are the forces acting on that piston face. So to find the work done on the piston, 
let's do that down here, work done on the piston. That's going to be force dot product with the displacement. Let me put a, a, a coordinate axis here. Let's call this the Z direction. So the force acting on the piston face, I'm going, going to have a positive P gas times area of the piston right here. That's acting in the positive Z direction. And then this will be negative from the atmospheric pressure. So minus P atmosphere times the area of the piston. Those are all acting in the K hat direction. They're all acting in the Z direction. So positive force due to the gas and negative force due to the atmosphere. All acting in the Z direction. And then I'm going to dot product that with the little bit of displacement in the Z direction. So that'll be a DZ K hat. It's just a small displacement in the Z direction. And that'll go, I'll integrate that as we go from some initial Z position to some final Z position. So when I expand that out, I'll have Z1, Z2 as my limits of integration. P gas minus P atmosphere. I can pull the area of the piston on the outside and then I'll be multiplied by a DZ. You can see when I do the dot product here, I have K hat, K hat. So this just will be multiplied by the DZ. And I brought the area of the piston outside the parentheses, so that's right there. Now, if I look at this for a moment, this is the area of the piston times the change in elevation. So that's actually a little bit of volume. It's like an area times a displacement. That's a little volume, dV. So let me write this down here in terms of the volume. P gas minus P atmosphere times the change in volume. And so I need to change my limits in terms of volume. So this will be the, instead of Z1 and Z2, it'll be the initial volume and the final volume. The reason the volume changes is because the Zs are changing. Now we know the pressures given here, right? So we're told the pressure in the gas, that goes all the way back up here. That was two bar absolute. So let me write that down, two bar. Pressure in the atmosphere is one bar absolute. Now one thing just to be careful of here is I need to make sure I'm using either absolute pressures for both of those pressures or gauge pressures for both. Now since the pressures are given as absolute, I'm just sticking with absolute pressures here. If I was using gauge pressures, then the atmospheric pressure would be zero and the gas pressure would be one bar because it would be the gas pressure, which is two bar, minus the atmospheric pressure, which would be one bar, so that would just leave it as one. I'd get the same result. But the key thing is to keep the pressures either both as absolute or both as gauge. And it's just more convenient here to keep them as absolute pressures. Now the volumes we were given already, we said the initial volume was 0.1 cubic meters, final volume was 0.12 cubic meters. So we can do this integral easily. Again, the pressures are constant, so they come outside the integral. And uh, when you plug all that in, you'll get that the work done on the piston comes out to be 2 kilojoules. It's different than the work done by the gas. The work done by the gas was 4 kilojoules. Work done on the piston is 2 kilojoules. The reason there's a difference is because in part A, we were finding the work done by the gas, whereas uh, and, and so the atmospheric pressure did not factor into it. For the piston, since we're trying to find the work done on the piston, we have to consider both the work, I mean, the pressure force of the gas on the piston face as well as the pressure force of the atmosphere on the piston face. So that's why it looks a little different down here. Okay, now the last part of the problem statement is evaluate the change in potential energy of the piston. So again, I think about how am I going to calculate the change in potential energy. That, uh, one way to do that is to apply the first law of thermodynamics to that piston face because that involves the potential energy, right? It, it shows up in the total energy term. So we'll apply the first law to that same system that I have shown on the screen here. So let's write that out. So it's the change in total energy of the system, which is our piston, heat going into the piston, and I'm going to write this as plus the work done on the system. The reason I'm going to use a plus work done on is because we just calculated the work done on the piston here, so it's just more convenient to use that. So we know that that number is 2 kilojoules. Now, the heat transfer into the piston is going to be zero 
And the reason for that is we're told that the piston and cylinder walls are fabricated from heat-resistant material. So that is going to be zero. Now, the change in total energy of the system, recall, is the change in internal energy plus the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. We're trying to find the change in the potential energy, so we don't know that yet. That's what we're trying to solve for. The change in kinetic energy will be zero because the piston, we're told, is moving very slowly. I believe that's part of the problem uh, statement here, that it's, it's being slowly heated. And so if it's being slowly heated, that means that this is just going to, the piston is also going to move very, very slowly. So the kinetic energy change is just zero. It's, it, similarly, we'll say that the change in the internal energy of the piston is zero because we're, we're going to assume, I'm just making this assumption, that the temperature of that piston face or that piston material is not going to change. So that's an assumption. So this delta U being zero, I'm going to say is equal to zero because it's, I'm assuming that the temperature of that piston material is not changing. We weren't told that information explicitly, but I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption that if we're if there's no heat transfer going through the piston material, as we're told, and we're adding heat directly into the gas, that the temperature of the piston face is not going to be significant. Okay, so what we're left with then is the change of potential energy will be the two kilojoules. All right, so that comes from the first law as a reminder. So I think we've covered everything we need to for this problem statement. We just finished part C, so we'll just end the example there.